day three of the school. So we start with uh, Ifan's uh, third lecture, right? About uh, non-invertible symmetries. Fourth? Ah, oh, sorry. Please. All right. Uh, good morning. Recording in progress. Uh, Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so today will be the uh, last lecture from me on non-invertible symmetries. So uh, in the previous lectures, uh, we have been focusing on the, the big picture, uh, the general structure of non-invertible symmetries. And especially, we spell out a lot, of, uh, a lot of this general structure in detail in two-dimensional CFDs. And in this lecture, we'll apply the knowledge we have gained to uh, identifying non-invertible symmetry in the very simple CFD, just to you know, get our hands dirty. That is in the case of uh, this one of the standard first non-trivial CFD that you probably encounter in any CFD class, the Ising CFD in two dimension. Okay? Uh, as, as I'll explain, this very simple CFD already gives an interesting instance of a non-invertible symmetry generated by a topological defect line. Okay? So let us start with a brief uh, reminder about, well, a brief review of the, uh, of the CFD. Okay? So first of all, the CFD has a center charge uh, equal to one half. Okay, so it's one of the simplest CFT. And the operator spectrum, equivalently the Hilbert space on S1, contain these primaries, okay, with subscript denoting the scaling dimensions, the identity operator, the spring operator of dimension 116, 116, and the energy operator of dimension one half, one half. Okay, and together with, because we are talking about two-dimensional CFT, the operator spectrum organized into various oral primaries and descendants. Here I'm listing the primaries, and then the rest of the states in the Hilbert space are generated by the various oral uh, descendants. This CFT has a famous symmetry, a very simple symmetry, that is the Z2 splint slip symmetry. The symmetry act on the CFT, this symmetry acts on the CFT very, in a very simple way. Um, a, all of the operators in this Huber uh, corresponding state in Huber space are even under the symmetry, except for the sigma operator and its virasoro descendant. The sigma operator and their virasoro, its virasoro descendants are odd under the two symmetry. And in terms of the notation that we have introduced, let's call this symmetry uh, generated by a topological defect line, eta, okay? And in terms of the picture we have been drawing, this means that when eta acts on the uh, local operator sigma, okay, by enclosing it, whenever we encounter this kind of graph in your correlation function, we are free to shrink this graph and obtain just the sigma operator by the way it's opposite sign at the same location, okay? A, as, as I've told you in the very first lecture, a hallmark of symmetry is that it gave rise to selection rules. In particular, in this case, because sigma operator is odd, this implies immediately any correlation function that involves odd number of sigmas. In particular, the case with three sigmas inserted at arbitrary locations better be zero. But this CFD is very simple. It's so simple that you can actually compute all the correlation functions of these uh, operators. I will ex not explain the technology, but you have to trust me that you can compute all the correlation functions. And then after you compute them, you will discover that, in fact, there are some other kind of hidden selection rule that says any correlation functions that involve an odd number of epsilon operators inserted at arbitrary points is again zero. Okay, so if you try to extrapolate between from this picture down to here, you want to say that there may be some hidden selection rule that could be explained by some hidden symmetry. Okay. And that is the symmetry that we'll be identifying 
It turns out that will be a non-invariable symmetry. Okay. Just a historical remark. Uh, so this non-invariable symmetry, this, the uh, the kind of the signal there, this non-invariable symmetry, um, goes all the way back uh, to Cranmer's one year. Okay. There's some already suggestion of such a non-invertible symmetry in this uh, simple model. Uh, since the work of Cranmer's and the one year, I believe, in the 1930s. Okay. So back then, people study uh, a lattice version of the CFT. Okay. Which is the last icing lattice model. You can think about as the statistical model in two space, space dimensions, uh, and is described by a Hamiltonian normalized by the temperature uh, in terms of nearest neighbor coupling of the spins on the square lattice. Imagine you have some square lattice, and on each side you have this spins, known by SI, and they can take two values, plus minus one, and this, this, uh, this notation means that you introduce this kind of nearest neighbor coupling for each pair of nearest neighbors, okay? And K is the dimensionless coupling constant. And as I said, as I was, I was saying, I was uh, briefly saying, uh, the same, same model, um, there's a very similar model related to this uh, that's described by one-dimensional transfer sizing model. That's the quantum version of this statistical model. This model is so simple that you can actually study its entire phase diagram as a function of k. Okay. And because uh, we have observed the temperature over here, you see that uh, this is equivalent to, to tune k is equivalent to tuning the temperature. So in particular, high temperature will correspond to the uh, small k uh, part of the phase diagram. And, uh, uh, low temperature will correspond to large K. And in these limits, it's very simple to solve the model. Okay, I will not solve it here. But you find that high temperature, uh, you have some non-degenerate vacua. Okay. And other, on the other hand, you have at low temperature, you have a doubly degenerate vacua that correspond to spontaneous, spontaneous breaking of the Z2 splint flip. Okay. As a consequence, you expect there to be a phase transition between these two different phases. This is usually referred to as the disorder phase. This is related to, re, re, referred to as other phase because the spontaneity symmetry breaking, okay? There's some phase transition over here, which happens at a special value of K, which is denoted by KC, that's a critical C, a critical value of K. And over here, the description is given by uh, there's a second order phase transition, and the phase transition is described by us, the icing CFT. Uh, which is the CFT we, we reviewed over here, okay? In particular, the sigma operator, the spin operator, is the CFT uh, version of this individual spins that live on individual lattice sites. Okay? What is the statement of the Kramer's one year duality? The Kramer's one year found when they study this, uh, this IC model, okay, as a function of K, there's some mysterious duality between the high temperature and the low temperature phase of the theory. They find, what is the duality? They, they find the following uh, equivalence relation, okay, that under the identification between a dual coupling, which I call K-dual, Mysterious relation, okay? Icing, and you see already see that uh, if one is small, the other is large, and the correspondingly, this relates the duality relates to the low temperature and high temperature limit of this phase diagram. Okay, and in more detail, it was found out that the precise statement is that icing at the low temperature. Uh, is equivalent or is dual to icing at high temperature okay, in the infinite volume. But to be precise, 
you also need to introduce another D2 gauge field. The reason being that uh, if you don't worry about the global issue, uh, sorry, if you, if you care about the global issue in particular, uh, like the number of degenerate ground states, obviously uh, the, these two phases will not match. Okay? But introducing this additional Z2 gauge field, which gauges the icing Z2 symmetry over here, uh, fixes the problem so that it's actually an exact duality. And because this duality relates the, uh, the low temperature and uh, high temperature IC model, and I should also say that in terms of the CFT, this phase diagram can be captured by the CFT, the icing CFT, couples to a relevant deformation, well, deformed by a relevant deformation, triggered by the precisely this energy operator, okay, which essentially dual to the Hamiltonian over here. where m squared is the coupling. And translated into this phase diagram, this, this point corresponds to m squared to the zero, so we are at the fixed point. And the high temperature phase corresponds m squared bigger than zero, and the low temperature phase corresponds m squared smaller than zero in my convention. Okay. So you may have different convention for your definition of the action, and there could be an opposite, these two phases could be flipped, okay? But that's my definition. In any case, This duality can be uh, written more explicitly as a transformation on these uh, couplings uh, from m squared going to minus m squared, okay? Because it goes from low temperature to high temperature and vice versa. And correspondingly, because, because how it couples uh, to the operator epsilon in your icing CFT, this is equivalent to sending epsilon to minus epsilon, okay? So this is already some hint that the kramers wenner duality may be related to this hidden symmetry that explains the selection rule at the fixed point. Well, the, the duality relation doesn't end here. There's also the famous duality relation that relates the sigma operator to the mu operator, okay? So recall, sigma is the oper outer operator, okay? It corresponds to the, this spin degrees freedom on the lattice. When it takes a non-trivial expectation value, that corresponds to the spontaneous, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking phase of the icing model, okay? On the other side, this is the disordered spin operator, okay? This is the operator that takes VEV on the disorder phase or high temperature phase of the icing model, okay? So when I draw this diagram, okay, this is in terms of the, this other parameter, sigma. All right. Then at the critical point, which in this case coincides with the self-dual point of this uh, uh, relation, meaning that pinch 2kc is equal to one, this duality infers, implies, sorry, this duality implies that the icing CFT is equivalent to its Z2 orbital fold. So this operation of coupling a quantum field theory to Z2 gauge field is essentially implementing the Z2 orbital fold, okay? And as is common uh, for dualities, duality typically re relates two descriptions of the same, same system. And if you, there are some parameter you can tune, then typically what happens is that a special point uh, at the parameter where the duality becomes a self-duality, the self-duality can be described by a symmetry. For example, you see this happens a lot on the moduli space couple manifold of two-dimensional CFTs, okay? One prototypical example is the T-duality of a compact boson, okay? Two T-duality maps the compact boson radius R to T over R, okay, you read in certain units. That is not a symmetry in general, but at the uh, self dual radius, which is described as SU2 level one, the T duality becomes a very special Z2 symmetry in the SU2 level one WZW model, okay? So we expect something, we're expecting something similar here, and we will discover that is indeed the case, but the difference is that in, that, in, the, in the case of SU2 level one, from the compact boson special radius, 
that symmetry is invertible, here we'll discover the corresponding symmetry will be non-invertible, okay? Which is correlated with this very special feature. So this is a question we want to ask. Okay. So there's many ways to pin down how, what this symmetry is. Okay. So let me give you one, one argument that uses this very simple uh, picture that we draw many times. That is the modular invariance for different different perspectives you can you can two different perspectives you can adopt to view the torus spreading function twisted uh, by uh, insertion uh, of some putative uh, topological defect line okay so this is again the the object we were considering is simply the torus spreading function of this uh, CFT a uh, twisted um, by this topological line, okay? So right now we are not assuming what this topological line is. We're, we're uh, uh, agnostic about the details of a line, but we'll deduce constraints from this very simple equation, okay? And once again, this is the same object, but with the topological line oriented in a different way. Oh, sorry, the other, the other way around. Okay, and as we said before, uh, this equality uh, leads to the following relation between a parting function, uh, between a parting function that's twisted in the time direction by the line defect insertion, weighted by the uh, Hamiltonian uh, associated with the CFT generated by L0 and L0 bar. And on other, the other, other hand, we have the trace with no other temporal insertion of the Hubert space twisted by the insertion of the topological line. And the S-dual version of the torus modulus enter into this expression. Okay, so I'm writing this for general C, but here C is equal to one half in this specific example. And the fact that the topological line preserves the stress tensor means that both left-hand side and right-hand side will have decompositions into the basic building block of 2D CFT, representation theory building block of 2D CFT, namely characters of the Rosero algebra at standard charge equal to one half. That is very constraining because unitary unit representations of the Rosero algebra as, at standard charge equal to one half only comes in three families, okay? There's the, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with the operators that we are talking about in the icing model in the absence of any uh, additional insertion, okay? The chiral representation. So that means the left-hand side uh, is, uh, let me call it, uh, is a linear combination of, The character associated with the identity operator, okay? Okay, let me call it alpha one, okay? Alpha zero, sorry. And the coefficient multiplying the character associated with the 116, wait, 116 representation, okay? And the character associated with the, uh, sorry, the h equal to one half representation, okay? And they correspond to physically the three operators identity, sigma, and epsilon, as well as their descendants. And these coefficients, which, are, which we are being agnostic about, determines how this operator acts on, this putative line operators acts on those operators, okay? The line operator acts on those local operators, okay? There are too many words about operators. Uh, hopefully, there's no confusion. And we can do the same thing for the right-hand side, okay? But as we said before, the, the right-hand side, in some sense, is more constrained so even though we are uh, 
because we are agnostic about the detail of the line, we don't know much about this defect Hubert space. But just from the Virasaurus symmetry, we know whatever this defect Hubert space is, it must be built from this basic building blocks, which involve these curve representations with weight zero, one half, and one sixteen. Okay? So you have potential, you have a sum over two numbers. This, each of these numbers can take value uh, in a set of three uh, possible representations. Okay? And the summand involves this coefficient, which is a positive integer, uh, non negative integer, that comes for the degeneracy of the representation in the given uh, twisted Hubert space. And they're multiplied by these characters. Okay? And this very simple relation, okay, so you have this equality, this very simple relation with the constraint that this coefficient of positive integer is surprisingly strong, okay? So I'll leave that as a homework, okay, to show that uh, there are three independent solutions to this equation, okay? meaning that all the other solutions will be generated by um, um, positive integer combination of the solution I'll write down. Okay? The first solution is such that, let me write those three solutions. The first solution is when they are both equal to one. The second solution is one minus one and one. Okay. And the third solution is square root two, zero minus square root two. Okay? The case when it's acting as one on uh, any of the three operators, identity sigma and epsilon, means that this is nothing but the trivial line, the identity line. The second one acts non trivially, trivially on everything except for the sigma operator, as well as the sentence identifies this operation generated by this putative line as the Z2 flip symmetry, Z2 spin flip symmetry. Okay, so this corresponds to the identity line, this corresponds to this eta line, okay? And this is the object that will give rise to this duality defect. Okay. So this is the only other possibility, and as you'll see, this is indeed a consistent solution, uh, a consistent symmetry operation, okay? In, in, in the sense that we'll give an alternative description, a derivation of this result that does not rely on any assumption, okay? So here it's like we assume the line exists. This is the most general form it can take. We'll give an alternative argument such that this line must exist. Question. Yes. Uh, but is it okay that some coefficient is negative? Uh, so this coefficients appear on the left hand side. Okay. What's important? What's the the, the equation? What's not true about the equation is that these coefficients are always non-negative. So it's your homework to see that having certain coefficients being negative is fine. But for example, you cannot have this coefficient being negative. Ah, but because in, in the left hand side is not a partition function, it's a... That's right, it's not a partition function, ah, okay. it's twisted in a temporal direction. Okay. okay. So this left hand side, keep track of how symmetry acts on the Hubert space with no twist. And, and sorry, and, and what, what are the corresponding value of the, of the coefficient n? You, you, you are keeping it arbitrary. Sorry, come again? The, coef, the coefficient n i j. Are arbitrary. Arbitrary, here. arbitrary, totally arbitrary. So but the only, the only, so to solve this equation, all you need to know uh, is that this coefficient has this property, but you leave it general, and you will find the solutions will be in general a positive integer linear combination. Sorry, non-negative in integer combinations of these guys. But w once you fix the alphas, uh, the n going to be fixed. Uh? 
yeah, so once you fix alpha, then n is obviously fixed. But to determine alpha, uh, you don't need to uh, make assumptions on n apart from what I have said. And, and sorry, just one other clarification. Why in the left-hand side you are assuming that uh, this is diagonal? Right, so this is the, what we know uh, from uh, something we just erased. Right, so, uh, so we know that uh, the way uh, the, this topological defect line uh, act on the uh, operators will be such that it cannot change its scaling dimension. In particular, it maps a Virasoro multiplet to a Virasoro multiplet. In the IC model, there's no degeneracy in the Hilbert space without twist, right? So for a given Virasoro representation, there's only one operator. So there's no other possibility than having just an overall number. All right, okay. And we can learn uh, a bit more from just this very simple table, okay? Just from this, uh, uh, from this uh, uh, how it acts on the operators in the untwisted Hubert space, you can already infer the fusion rule, okay? okay. In particular, the fusion rule of obviously of eta uh, square to identity. That's what we expect for Z2 symmetry. Moreover, when you fuse the duality defect with eta in either way, you recover the duality defect. Okay? That, that is because this entry is zero. Okay? Furthermore, if you square the duality defect, you get one plus eta. So these rules are uniquely determined just by postulating the most general fusion rule with non-negative uh, fusion coefficients and consistency with this table. Okay. This defines uh, what's known as the icing fusion rule. Name is not so surprising. Okay, and as I said before, once you have a set of topological defect lines and you have specified the fusion rules, okay, there's the consistency condition just coming from locality of the theory says that they should, uh, they should furnish uh, to this whole fusion category structure, meaning that it should have consistent solutions to the F symbols. So there's a consequence of locality and uh, essentially the isotopy invariance. Okay? In other words, the, uh, the, F, the F symbols associated with junctions formed by these topological defect lines uh, would have to satisfy the Pentagon equation. And that has been solved. Okay, so here I'm listing the solutions. Uh, this was actually, this problem was solved in generality that generalized this particular fusion rule in the case when the Z2 is replaced by a Zn by the work of Tambara and Yamagami. Okay, so in general, we call it Tambara Yamagami fusion category associated with the general abelian symmetry. Okay, they, generate, they generalize the case with just eta. Okay, but here I'm listing the full data of the fusion category in the case of this particular icing fusion rule. Okay, so in particular, your simple objects are these three topological defect lines. They satisfy this fusion rule, which I showed before. And there's only one non-trivial junction where not any, none of the three lines involve the identity. So whenever three of the external legs involve identity that correspond to a trivial junction, okay, as we said before, that comes from just bringing the identity operator in the bulk to the defect line. Okay. This is the only non-trivial junction in this game. Okay. And then uh, these trivial, non-trivial junctions enter into various uh, non-trivial F symbol uh, associated with this fusion category, which I have listed here. So the important thing is about this sign, okay? Which is similar to what appears in the case of group-like symmetry case, okay? The fusion symbols, the F symbols are uh, faces in general. But the, char the characteristic of this non-invariable uh, symmetry case is that the F symbols uh, are in general not just faces. It will involve this matrix elements, okay? Which are not, uh, not faces. 
and we'll use. Question. There's a question. Sorry, but uh, we know that uh, Tambara Yamagami's fusion categories are not uniquely fixed by diffusion rules. Right? Very good, very good. So, uh, so here I jumped over one small subtlety, is that if you uh, just use this particular fusion rule for the Z2 case, there are two solutions uh, up to gauge freedom to the F symbols. Here, what I'm writing down is the F symbol that will be relevant for the icing CFT, okay? And there is some physical meaning to the choice of... Uh, Sorry? There is some physical meaning uh, for the choice of uh, this one of the two solutions. Ah, uh, it, uh, it's because the CFT actually realized just one of them. I think CFT realized one of them. The other is realized by the SU2 WZW model at level two. Okay. And there is a way to see that. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yes. But I'm afraid I don't have time to explain that detail here. Okay. But thanks for the question. Okay. And uh, just from how. Uh, this solution looked like, okay, and it tells you how this uh, duality defect acts on the untwisted Hubert space. Uh, we have these diagrams, okay, which we have been drawing before. So acting on identity, which is equivalent to inserting nothing, okay, this gives you square root two, okay, we're just copying down the, the table over there into the diagram we have been drawing, okay. This means that when, whenever you have this duality defect encircling nothing, you can just shrink it and the cost is to include additional factor of square root two. Okay? And if you have instead uh, the epsilon operator uh, inserted in the interior of this loop generated by the duality defect, you have the cost of introducing an extra minus sign. Okay? And similarly, uh, instead, if you have uh, the sigma operator inserted uh, inside the loop, uh, you will just have zero, okay? It's completely annihilated. And this is, the this is another signature of this, this topological defect line being non-invertible. So it annihilates certain operators, okay? But they will be in a sense where this operator will be recovered, okay? But it will recover in a way that will be consistent with this uh, duality relation. And this is what we'll see next, okay? So instead of, as we said before, uh, a feature of this uh, non invertible topological defect is that it doesn't just give maps between uh, uh, the, you know, the Hubert space that twisted to itself, okay? It also gives maps between a uh, defect Hubert space twisted by a given line to a defect Hubert space twisted by a different line, okay? In particular, gives maps from the defect Hubert space without twist to a defect Hubert space with twist, okay? And such linear operations are represented by, again, this kind of diagram. So this is a diagram we, that we call Lasso diagram, okay? When we discuss the generality, but with potentially with a non-trivial junction. So I'll be using the red to represent eta and using the, okay, this, this is not very red. The red line to represent this eta symmetry defect and the white circle to represent the, uh, the duality defect. Oh, I should also have said that here, uh, the, the, the defects that's involved in the icing fusion, the fusion category, they're all self-dual, so I do not to keep, need to keep track of the arrow, okay? Just in case you worry about the subtlety. Question. Uh, again, about the F-symbols, uh, is it not true that uh, you always have the solution with trivial F-symbols? Come, come again? Is it not true that you always have a solution with trivial F symbols? No. No? Okay. No. So, so as I said before, uh, F symbol, uh, what F symbol is doing is giving you the change of basis between different representations of the junctions associated with four external legs. Because it's a change of basis, it will always have to be invertible. So it cannot be trivial. Oh, but, uh, by oh, by trivial, trivial, I, I, I identity? I, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't mean zero. I mean uh, that essentially you have no anomaly. Yeah, so, uh, well, trivial, uh, so trivial could be zero, trivial could be one, identity matrix. Yeah, one, let's say one. Yeah. So that would not be consistent because you have multiple fusion channels, okay? That would be okay for, you know, when, that's the case for non-anonymous group-like symmetry. Okay? But because you have these multiple channels, you cannot put one here and here, okay, to be consistent. So for, for, for some fusion rules, uh, you necessarily have anomalies. Come again? Uh, what you're saying is that for, um, 
given the future rules, uh, there are future rules that implies automatically that you have Toft anomalies. Uh, I'm not sure I, I, I get your question. Maybe it's better to, to ask that again in the discussion okay, session. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what I was saying here is just that there's this additional actions, linear actions, uh, of these topological defects, the duality defect, represented by these white circles, acting operators, okay, and sending operators not to the Hilbert space without twist, but to a Hilbert space twist. In this particular case, twisted specifically by the eta line, okay? So once again, because every junction is topological, so you can shrink this diagram, so this produces for you an operator that's attached to this eta line. Okay? And this is precisely the operator mu that's relevant here. How do we see that? Okay? So once again, uh, because the theory is simple enough, you can actually sp uh, uh, specify the entire Huber space. Okay? So every state that lives in here is a state uh, in the Huber space twisted by uh, eta. Okay, so similarly to the, uh, to the uh, IC model without twist, here the Hubert space is completely fixed. Uh, it consists of the operator that corresponds to the remnant of the fermion uh, before you bottomize the size of dimension one half on either side, okay? And just one other operator of uh, dimension 116, 116, okay? And for the same reason as before, this topological operation of shrinking this, uh, this diagram Encircling this operator does not change its scaling dimension. And because there are a single operator of dimension 116, 116, it has to be proportional to this guy. And the coefficient can be fixed by asking this operator to have normalized two point functions. Okay? And what you find is that the coefficient with that particular choice of normalization is square root 2. And similarly, okay, just to be consistent with such a duality operation, uh, another thing uh, that you may wonder if is this kind of diagram, this again, a lasso diagram. But encircling instead the mu operator. Okay, so like this. So for this to be consistent, this better give you something similar to this. Okay, so it should be zero. Why is this zero? Okay, this is why, this is why I draw, uh, draw it over here. Okay, this minus sign is crucial. So look at this region. Apply that F move, because this this operator is scalar. You can freely rotate this uh, this red spoke all the way around, and because in the in the process of moving it all the way around, it crosses this uh, this point once, uh, at which you use this operation, it gives up a minus sign. It will assess, that would mean that this diagram is equivalent to, equivalent to minus times itself. That implies this diagram vanishes. Okay? And furthermore, uh, a similar exercise to what we did over here tell you that if you have this diagram, color not. Okay, again shrink it. So what this diagram means is that it's a map uh, induced by the topological defect line on the Hilbert space twisted by eta to into the Hilbert space without twist. Okay, so because when you shrink it, there's no dangling, uh, there's no dangling line defect. Okay, so this better produce the state in the Hilbert space without twist. And what you find is that it's indeed you recover uh, this operator, okay, the spin operator. So what we see from this, uh, these diagrams is the following. If we just focus on the, the, how the duality defect acts restricted to the Hubert space without twist, it looks invertible. Oh, sorry, it looks non-invertible because it annihilates the operator. But somehow this non-invertibility is not, uh, can be, this invertibility can be recovered once you realize there are other non-trivial maps that max, max one defect Hubert space to another. In particular, the Hubert space without twist to the Hubert space with twist. So there's a sense in this particular uh, non-invertible symmetry that once you include 
how, once you take into account how the duality defect acts on all the defect Hilbert spaces, it is really invertible. Okay, so you are not losing information. And that is why it makes sense to talk about it as a, you know, uh, as a remnant of the duality, primary surrounding duality at the self dual point. Okay. So there's another the picture that is helpful to represent the way the duality defect acts on local operators is to instead imagine that uh, you have the duality defect over here and some local operator uh, inserted around it. Okay? This is the diagram we draw when we uh, discuss the topological feature of these defect lines. And as we know, uh, as we have drawn this many times, okay, you can deform the duality defect line as a consequence of topology invariance, as a topology invariance, this diagram uh, produce the same observable when you insert in correlation functions. But because, because of this diagram, okay, this implies, okay, and you apply the fusion rule over here, so this is the fusion rule here is important, so let me, uh, So you apply the fusion rule for these two corners, okay, using, sorry, you apply the F move for that two corners using that uh, rule. What you find is one over square root of two times this diagram, okay, plus attached to the eta line and then further attached to the duality line. Okay, and then you use what we have already discussed over here. Okay, so there's one diagram I didn't draw, uh, oh, I didn't draw, which is the case when you have this this line attached to the epsilon. I'll leave that exercise to convince yourself that this is zero, okay, from a similar argument, and this this implies, uh, combining with this fact, okay, that this is uh, this is equivalent to flipping the sign of epsilon. Okay, so the cost to move, move across this energy operator, uh, to move the duality defect across the epsilon operator to flip its sign. You can do a similar analysis. And this is, okay, and this uh, explains this selection rule, okay? So we have achieved in explaining the selection rule using this symmetry. And the way you do that is to put a, a topological defect line at one end and move it all the way. You pick up all the faces, but you can also annihilate to the vacuum. So, um, and you get a contradiction if this is non-zero, and that's how you argue the selection rule. Uh, similar exercise, uh, in view of time, let me again leave as a homework, but doing the same procedure, again, uh, using this, uh, uh, the F symbols we wrote over here, over there, what you will find is precisely the expected relation that says that when you move uh, the duality defect across the sigma operator, which is charged on the Z2, you will get instead the disorder operator, which lives in the Hilbert space twisted by the Z2 line. Okay? This explains this duality mapping between sigma and I mu. Okay? And you can do it also inversely, move the mu across and you bring the sigma. Okay, so combining this picture, this explains the Kramer's one duality at the self dual point with this non trivial transformation rule that sends this basic operator in the icing CFT. Okay. To These operators, which naturally are local operators in the icing CFT after Z2 over four, okay? So the mu operator is not a good operator, it's not a good local operator uh, before you do the overflow because it is attached to a non-local line, okay? But after you do the overflow, this becomes a local operator. 
And this operation explains, uh, in what sense, this is a precise uh, symmetry, okay? All right, so let's now discuss, so that's the uh, kind of explicit example of how non-invertible symmetry uh, works in motion, okay? Let's now, given this example, let's now deduce some consequences, okay? So the, 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 the uh, a main point here is that uh, this symmetry, I'll, I'll, just like a Z2 symmetry, okay? Uh, we discussed it in the very simple CFT, like I think CFT, but the structure of the symmetry is quite general, okay? It shows up in various interesting system, and it can be used to deduce uh, non-trivial consequences, for example, on RG flows, okay? So this is the, what we'll discuss now. Uh, the dynamical consequence for RG flows, okay? So what is the, the general picture for RG flow, okay? So you have some, uh, we focus on the case when you have some quantum field theory uh, uh, for, uh, which we'll call TUV, which is the UV description for some uh, potential uh, RG flow, okay? You can trigger some RG flow for example, by some relevant deformation or by gauging, okay? Uh, this will end up with a non-trivial IR phase in general, okay, if the theory is strongly coupled. And there are several possibilities for what the IR phase may look like. So possibility number one is trivially gapped. Meaning that there's a unique vacuum that's gapped, okay, only a massive Excitations above the vacuum. Possibility number two is uh, vacuum degeneracy, or in other words, a so gapped with multiple vacua, okay, but discrete, okay, because it's gapped. Uh, this corresponds to the case, for example, uh, when you have some discrete symmetry that is spontaneously broken in two-dimension context. And the third possibility is gapless. In other words, described by a non-trivial CFT. Okay, so these are the three general possibilities for an RG flow, okay? So let's focus on the two-dimension case from now on. Um, and, and for example, consider RG flow triggered by a CFT in two-dimension perturbed by a relevant uh, operator. Okay. That's the meaning of being relevant, okay. and also uh, scalar, so that we preserve the Lorentz symmetry. Okay, so, Symmetry that's preserved by RG flow generally leads to constraints on what the IR phase diagram may look like, okay? And here, we want to consider this non-invertible symmetry. So we first need to introduce in what sense is non-invertible symmetry preserved by RG flow of this form. A non-invertible symmetry that generated by a topological defect line called L, is conserved if it is transparent to the deformation operator. We can move it across the operator without introducing any phase vector, okay? That's mean it's transparent, just like how stress sensor is always transparent to topological defects. This ensures that the topological defect remains topological under this deformation. Okay? And then there's a very simple theorem, okay, once we have defined what it means for a symmetry generated by a non-invertible topological defect to be preserved under RG, there's a very simple theorem we can state. 
the theorem, the very simple theorem states the following. If a quantum field theory admits a topological defect line, L, okay, such that its VEV, okay, its quantum dimension, its VEV on the cylinder, uh, is not uh, integer, positive integer, okay, but preserve along RG, then the IR theory, the IR phase, cannot be trivially gapped. Okay? So the only possibility will be a non-trivial uh, TQFT, which is described in multiple vacua, okay? Or a gapless CFT. And this is a very simple theorem. There are refined statements that constrains how precisely the symmetry is spontaneously broken. Okay. So let me just quickly give you the argument for this theorem, which is very simple to prove. So the proof proceeds by contradiction. Essentially, the same steps that, that you will go through in solving that homework problem uh, will lead to the proof of this statement, okay? And the proof actually only uses something even simpler, okay? So assume because we are proving by contradiction, we assume the theory flows to a TQFT or a gap phase with one vacuum state. Okay? Meaning that there's only one operator of dimension zero comma zero in this TQFT. Okay? And while it preserves a topological defect L. So we, we can simply consider this again, this torus primary function, twisted by the topology defect in the time direction, in the temporal direction, and which is related by a modular S transformation to the configuration with the topology defect line inserted in the uh, uh, twisted, twisting the spatial direction. Okay? But in this uh, TQFT, we can compute this primary function very simply. On the left-hand side, we have a trace over uh, the Hubert space, S1, okay? Weighted by, twisted by this insertion, okay? The same L had before. Because the TQFT, the Hamiltonian is trivial, you literally just get a trace. There's no non-trivial Q dependence, okay? And because there's only one state in this Hubert space, okay? There's only one state in the D by R. This just gives you the number, and that's nothing but the VEV of this line operator. But using the right-hand side of this representation, uh, of this uh, uh, relation, on the right-hand side, instead, you have a trace over the defect Huber space that's punctured through by this uh, defect line, okay? And there's nothing inserted because there's no more twist and it just corresponds to one, okay? And just because you have a Huber space, this has to be a non-negative integer. So we arrive at the contradiction to the assumption in the theorem. Thus, we have proved the theorem. Okay? Yes? So if the number of states in the twisted sector is bigger than one, no? Yeah. Would you still call it a trivially gapped phase or...? A uh, so it could be that uh, in the twisted sector there are more than one state, but as long as there's only a trivial vacuum, a single state in the untwisted sector, I would still call it a trivial gap state. Okay. okay. 
So according to this definition. Okay. That's, yeah, no, it, that's where the, that's the circumstance where the theorem applies. Yes. But it can uh, be refined. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So does this also apply to higher dimensions then? Or yeah, yeah. So uh, well, okay. The very same so. argument. So I should, yeah, very good. So very same argument applies in higher dimension, and indeed that is how. Uh, uh, the higher dimensional version of this dynamical uh, constraint, this taking this taking uh, taking this form, have been derived. Okay. Thanks. But of course, in higher dimension, you have more choices for what you call a torus, depending on the choice of the space uh, d minus one dimensional slice. Okay. So let me now use the other side. Uh, the other table that I wrote before, to apply this dynamical constraint uh, to another less trivial example, okay, beyond icing, what is the simplest next, simplest next non-trivial CFT is the tricodial icing CFT, okay? So, let me just write over here. So, example of the application of this theorem, okay? So, here, I've written down the, the, the operator content of the tricodial icing CFT. This is the, uh, this is the next minimum model of standard charge six, 7 over 16. Uh, it has six uh, Virasoro primaries, and because the theory is so simple, you can actually solve the entire, uh, you can actually uh, identify all the topological defect lines in this theory, and there are six of them. Okay? The detail is not important. What is important, there's, there are two uh, distinguished subcategories. This is one called the Fibonacci category. It's also called the Young category. It is generated by a single, to single topological defect line, W. And it has this very interesting fusion rule. It squares to not quite itself, but with an additional uh, identity of line also appears, okay? And it's, uh, this line is also um, uh, uh, same as its dual, okay? And the icing category appears also in this uh, tractive icing CFT. And this is correlated with the fact that similar to the icing CFT, the tricodial icing CFT also have the Kramer's one year type duality. It's self dual under Z2 gauging. Okay? But what's important about this particular uh, subcategories generated by the uh, topology defect line W and N is that this W and N, they have the common feature that their VEVs okay, are uh, non integral. Okay? In particular, the, the quantum dimension of this duality defect line is square root 2. Okay? On the other hand, the quantum dimension associated with this W line, because they have to solve the same polynomial equation given by the fusion rule, you can find out is a golden ratio. Okay? And so if you have any RG flow that preserves the symmetries, and from the general theorem we just discussed, then it will, it's guaranteed to land on a non-trivial IR phase. So we just have to go through the table to find out which operators, if there are, preserving these lines. Okay? And that, as we said, preserving means that you have a, this line over here, and you can move it across uh, with, without introducing any factor. Okay? So this is the equivalent to, uh, uh, to, to that, the, the, this, this diagram. Is, uh, is equal to the, the VEV of the topological defect line multiplying uh, this operator, okay? So if you, in terms of this diagram, this will be the equivalence relation. So we just have to go through this table and look for operators phi when L is either the W line or the uh, duality line that uh, this equation is satisfied. And it's easy to spot that for the, uh, for the duality line, the relevant operator, so you're looking for h, because h equal to h bar, you're looking for operators which are smaller than one, the relevant operator will be this one. Okay? So this is the operator that preserves the duality, uh, preserve the duality defect, okay? And if you look for operator that preserve uh, this, uh, this w line, okay? Then the only option is the sigma prime operator. that is relevant. So what this means is that the tricodial 
we have the immediate uh, prediction that the tracheal eye zinc be formed by sigma prime, okay, and deformed by epsilon prime, okay. In this case, we preserve the Fibonacci category, okay. In this case, we preserve the icing category, okay. So they cannot be trivially gapped. So if gapped, if gapped, there has to be non-trivial vacuum degeneracy, okay. And uh, you, can, you can actually derive a stronger result, which I did not explain, that you can sh actually show the minimal number of degeneracy is two. Okay, and here, the minimal degeneracy from a similar argument is equal to three. Okay, but note that there's no other symmetry for this deformation, there's no other symmetry if we don't know about this non-invertible symmetry. Having some degeneracy typically you want to interpret as something being spontaneously, symmetry, uh, spontaneously broken that leads to this degeneracy, okay? Just like the D2 degeneracy in the icing case in the low temperature phase. But here, there's no, if you don't have this non-invertible symmetry, there's no other symmetry that's responsible for these degeneracies, okay? Instead, these degeneracies are enforced by non-invertible symmetry. Okay. In particular, uh, this is a prediction, and one can go ahead and check if this is actually the case, given the tracheal icing model. Okay. This RG flow is integrable, and you can check this statement. Okay. So if it's gap, indeed, which correspond to one particular sign of deformation, indeed, you have three degenerate vacuum, okay? This side is not integrable. But you can check numerically, and you will find out that indeed has a two degenerate vacuum, okay? It turns out that uh, uh, for this deformation, there's another possibility. As I said, the general theorem rules out the possibility of having a singly, uh, the single vacuum a single gap vacuum. There's another possibility of being a non-trivial CFD saturating this symmetry, and that is the nothing but the, the icing CFD. Okay? With the opposite sign uh, of this affirmation. So okay? So this is just a very simple application of the general theorem we derived, and this is a similar theorem can be applied in higher dimension to deduce similar um, statements. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so let me just uh, uh, summarize uh, these lectures by uh, listing some other aspects which I did not discuss, but uh, you are free to ask me afterwards. So let me just summarize. So in these lectures, we spend a lot on the basics of non-invertible symmetries. And hopefully through these lectures, I'll convince you that they are as good as the usual symmetries. Okay. In particular, they give rise to uh, selection rules and leads to uh, constraints on RG flows, okay? Or an IR phase diagram of some UV description. What I didn't discuss is that uh, in, this talk, in this lectures, I focus on the bosonic uh, theories and topological defects in the, in the uh, bosonic theories. There, there are extension to the fermionic case, just like the extension of bosonic group-like symmetry to the fermionic case, including the fermion parity. And that story can be tied together with what I discussed using the bosonization duality, okay, in two dimension and higher. And as I just uh, discussed, uh, this non-invertible symmetry, similarly to usual symmetries, can undergo symmetry break, spontaneous symmetry breaking, okay, and it can be used to explain degeneracy of the vacuum. And 
Something I also didn't discuss is that this non liberal symmetry, if they're not anomalous, they can be gauged. Okay? So there's a precise way to gauge a non anomalous, uh, in some sense, uh, non anomalous, non invertible symmetries. And this is the way to produce other CFTs, okay? uh, using, starting from CFTs with non invertible symmetries. Okay? And the list goes on. Uh, essentially, the list contains all the nice things we like about usual symmetries. And it's a more general, it's a kind of a more general, uh, richer uh, framework. Okay? And lastly, let me just try to connect to uh, the other lectures. The very nice lectures by the other lecturers at the school, okay? Just posing some questions uh, for you to think about, okay? The obvious question uh, in relation to Laura's lectures uh, is to look for this non-invertible symmetries, okay, in the context of a celestial CFT, okay? And the potential applications of this non-invertible symmetries on constraining the S matrix of massless particles. And in relation uh, to Matthias and uh, Kevin's uh, lectures, a puzzle, uh, current puzzle, is to understand these non-invertible symmetries in the context of ADS-CFT. Okay? And in relation to the notion of no global symmetry in quantum gravity. Okay? So in particular, in the context Study this non liberal symmetry in the context of the ADS3 tensionless string, okay. which, is a, which is a very nice explicit playground to, to discuss the non liberal symmetry in the quantum gravity. In that case, describe some explicit string theory, which we will hear more from Matthias. And similarly, in higher dimensions, perhaps in the twisted holography. Higher dimension, the string theory in the bulk is much more complicated. Perhaps, perhaps one can make some progress using the twisted holography. Okay, so that is the end of my lectures. Uh, but hopefully, uh, this will not be the end of your journey uh, in the world of non rural symmetries. So sorry for going over time. I'll take questions. Okay, let's start